Okay. Yeah. So this is not on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good to be here. Good to see a lot of friends in the room. Uh, today we are going to talk about surprise, surprise packet framework, a topic that is very close and dear to my heart. If you guys monitor the dpdk.org mailing list, you'll see us talking about packet framework. Uh, you see a lot of patches right now. There is a lot of work going on. Um, so the idea maybe here is to kind of uh, give people an overview of, of, about what this is and what we are trying to do here. Maybe one question first. Who from the room knows what packet framework is or knows that it exists? OK. <coughs> delighted, delighted, yeah. Uh, delighted especially that uh, we, um, we don't really do a good job at uh, showing people what we have and what uh, cool features we have. We tend to keep our heads down and do work and implement features, test things, um, send patches, in, and we tend to do less about community calls, about presenting uh, to people what this is about and what they can use. So we'll try to catch up with this today a bit, probably not that much, uh, but maybe we can follow up with some community calls. There is a lot of stuff here, and I really want to, to get feedback from people, what people think is useful, what people think is not that useful, what, uh, what people would like to see see uh, see doing next as new features and also I'd like to see more people contributing so I, I'm, I'm really open I, I sometimes I'm a very strong headed towards some design things but uh, I'm uh, also open to, to new ideas and I got a lot of the ideas that we currently implemented from really talking to customers and uh, mostly people from research that have the luxury of thinking of it. okay so um, We'll talk a bit about the motivation. We'll talk a bit about the, the libraries, which is uh, things that should be uh, should be should have a good API that we preserve over time. We don't change things that often. So, uh, um, for packet framework, these DPDK libraries are called Liberty Port, Liberty Table, Liberty Pipeline. Maybe you already recognize some of these uh, these names from OpenFlow uh, terminology. So we're going there, and uh, we are. Uh, if if you do, then you are on the right path uh, for understanding. And then we'll talk about uh, one of the applications that is very complex right now. I would say it's probably the biggest application in PDK. If you guys count the lines of code, it's called the IP pipeline. I don't really see uh, look at it as a, just an application. I mostly look at it as an application generator. I look at it as a tool to actually generate a lot of configuration, a lot of applications, something that is very flexible, that can glue together components. Um, so what's the motivation for packet framework? Uh, um, the, the end goal is basically to be able to write applications quickly, develop packet processing pipelines quickly, like for, sorry, uh, like, okay, back. Like for example, <coughs> take requirements for, let's say, a typical edge router that basically sits between two networks and uh, turn them into, into a, a set of requirements like a, a functional pipeline for upstream and downstream. And then how do you turn them into code? You look at the PDK and you see we have a lot of libraries, right? Uh, and we have a lot of building parts and uh, we say, yeah, they are great. You can really use these to get better performance. You can write your application, you can fix the packet IO problem, get packets into the CPU, you can, uh, you have so many algorithms to do uh, searches in the tables, like for uh, LPM for routing tables, hash tables for classification, R tables, and so forth. But how do you actually put these together? And if you put them together, do you really get the same performance? So that's, that's the key challenge, and it's for us as well. So we really look at packet framework like a tool to kind of put together all these, uh, these <coughs> building parts and actually create a car, and actually drive the car and see if car runs well, or maybe not that well. Obviously, there is always room for improvement. So um, that helps us uh, also to test the DPDK and to, to see what combinations work better and what work not that well just to know what to recommend to our customers. 
It's not just for Intel to use it, obviously, it's part of DPDK, it's open source. It's for anybody to use it and build pipelines. So the keyword is build fast. Build fast and build something that is realistic. We don't want to build something fast that is not realistic. That, that won't really work. Uh, so that's the motivation. Uh, then once we do that, maybe we can also, for example, build um, a reference edge router pipeline. Okay? And then that could also serve as a benchmark. That could, al could also see, uh, uh, serve us to, to track performance of the, the different DPDK releases. Because, for example, I, I did some tests on <coughs> GPDK release 1.7, and then I did some other tests. Maybe I skipped 1.8, I was doing something else, and then I came, when I came back for 2.0 and running the same code or similar code, I, I could see for some combinations a performance drop. And it was very difficult to actually track that down. Why did we lose performance? Or why, do, why are we getting more performance? The other way around, the happy case, which sometimes happens, but what I've been able to see is the other case, the bad case, when performance grows. So how do you track this? One solution is to actually monitor performance. If you have these benchmarks, I think this is what Thomas also talked about, if we could develop some benchmarks that could be micro benchmarks, for example, for low level uh, processing of cache lines, so on and so forth, but also for realistic applications <coughs> like, let's say, reference uh, edge routers, reference, I don't know, whatever, device you want, whatever function you want. And then we could actually uh, get those performance numbers overnight, every day. Every new patch that goes into the PDK could actually, we could find out the next day if they impacted performance. Uh, and they could also serve us as, as a benchmark. Maybe we, going forward, we can propose some of these things as, as industry benchmarks, if, if, the, if we'll get a lot of, or significant traction. So how do we do this? Well, we, we started, uh, maybe uh, the first time we released Packet Framework was release 1.7. So what we had at that time were a bunch of libraries. Port library, table library, and pipeline library. Uh, and uh, we basically have to take a decision, how are we going to rapidly prototype this? So then we came to OpenFlow, and we saw that OpenFlow is a, it's, it's a nice standard. It actually tells you how to configure switches. Uh, but what it also gives you is, is a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, maybe I should have done this slide. What it also gives you is a perspective on how you could actually think about your switch. You could think it, ab about it like a chain of tables that are interconnected. And then you have instructions in those tables, what to do the packet. You have uh, actions uh, on what to do the packet. So we came up with the these concepts of uh, similar to OpenFlow of ports and tables that are connected together. You populate tables with entries that contain actions, tell you what to do the packet. And then you create a pipeline. So uh, this is what we did here, let's say, to create a pipeline. This is how we do it. This is how it, uh, it really works. Um, this is a single core model. Because this, is, this was one important decision, how to scale across multiple cores. We could actually create a pipeline implementation that is very complex. You could actually give a pool of cores to the same pipeline. But you end up with a lot of race conditions and a lot of synchronization requirements between those CPU cores. So we ended up with a decision to actually build a pipeline that is a single, um, single core model. Um, it, it can, a pipeline basically is assigned to a CPU core. You can have a CPU core running multiple pipelines, but you cannot split a pipeline across different CPU cores. So then how do you actually uh, create a complex application given that we have multi-core CPUs? So the, the answer is we, we simply create these pipelines with a single core view in mind, and then we uh, map them to CPU cores, and uh, we connect them together through these devices <coughs> that are streaming packets, that are the ports of the pipeline. So basically a software queue here is an output port for this pipeline, it's an input port for this other pipeline. On this CPU core over here, you can see that we can actually run multiple pipelines on the same CPU core. It's not, ju it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between a pipeline and the CPU core, it's actually a one-to-many uh, mapping. So, um, why do we create these libraries? So, why did we have to create the port library? Well, <coughs> We know that we have, to, we have so many devices that can stream packets in DPDK. You can have software queues, hardware queues, 
um, you can have uh, traffic managers, uh, quality of service um, uh, devices, schedulers, right, which have a, an API similar to a queue, similar to a pole mode driver. So we know that in order to interconnect these together to create pipelines, they have to talk the same language. So basically they have to have the same API. So then we came up with, a, let's say, a simple wrapper saying, okay, if you are a port, you need to implement this abstract API of how to create a port, how to free the port. If you are a reception port, how to read the packets. If you are a transmission port, how to write the packets, how to flush uh, the output to buffer if there is a flush method that you want to assign to your port. And given this uh, concept, we were able to, to, to encapsulate and uh, integrate uh, functionality functionalities that are a bit more complex than just packet uh, RSTX. For example, IP fragmentation and reassembly. Think about a queue where input packets are uh, normal packets or jumbo frames and the output packets are all, or always uh, MPU or less size packets. So normal packets, non-jumbo packets. So basically this queue will actually fragment your input packets. You could think of it as, as a queue, it's a streaming device. Maybe it's not a first in, first out, it's not a, an order. Uh, okay, maybe for this port it's, uh, it's actually ordered because you, uh, you have to chop a jumbo frame into uh, smaller, smaller frames. Uh, for the assembly it might be different. You might have to actually store uh, that, that frame, those frames for a while until you get a full package. But anyway, the concept is very clear. You can actually map all these things in here into queues, into, into ports, into what we call ports, devices that can stream packets. Tables. Why, why create this abstraction for a table? Well, because if you look in DPDK, you'll see like you have an LPM table that has uh, an API, uh, which basically uh, the, the, the lookup key is an IP destination. Uh, which can be IPv4 or IPv6, different number of bytes. Uh, uh, the output is actually an index. It's a, it's a ne next hop index. If, if you look at hash tables, the, the output might be the position in the table or might be a pointer. Um, if you look at ACL, the output is yet another index. So what this library, library is actually uh, solved is the problem of doing the search algorithm. That algorithm that I mean, it takes a, a, a while to research and understand how it works. But it doesn't really give you the full solution for a table. At the end of the day, a table is what is. It's a mechanism that allows you to associate uh, some data with a key. A variable number of bytes, that is your data, opaque, array of bytes, to a key whose format, who is also an array, uh, the key is also an array of bytes, which has a format that is defined by the algorithm, right? It might be an IP destination, or it might be a number of uh, bytes for exact match hashes, so on and so forth. So how do we do that? How do, at the end of the day, the key format might be different, but the mechanism is the same. You simply need to retrieve an array of bytes uh, for that key in a in a in a uh, in, in, in a in a clear way without uh, um, ambiguities, right? So. We came up with this abstraction for the table and we integrated all the, the, the search algorithms from DPDK for exact match, ACL, LPM. Uh, array is simply an array uh, table where the lookup key is simply the index into the array. We could also do pattern matching. Uh, we can talk about how this could be done. Uh, so what do we get out of this? We get basically an API for tables and if you know uh, this API, you, sh you don't really need to read L how LPM API works and understand all that. You can use all of them out of this API and simply switch very easily between one algorithm or the other if you need to. Then about actions, um, obviously we have some actions to, to send packets uh, through these, uh, these elements in the pipeline, uh, like send uh, a packet to an output port from here, send a packet to the next table or drop the packet. Uh, we can do edits on the packets, we can push headers, we can uh, pop headers like labels, we can modify uh, headers, we can update TTL, so on and so forth. We can do flow uh, classification, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, flow, flow, uh, flow related uh, actions like metering, statistics, application identification, so on and so forth. We can uh, interface with accelerators. So what we get is basically by combining all these things we get pipelines. 
So pipeline is like a functional block. So then what we want to do is also, in this IP pipeline application, uh, we are creating a lot of example pipelines. Exa functional uh, pipelines that people can actually use straight out of the box, just uh, use a configuration file from the application to glue together all these things and create, like in a Lego way, create very complex things potentially. Um, so how does this work at, uh, let's say, single core level, at the pipeline level, is probably obvious to people by now. Uh, we read packets, we just iterate through the input ports of the pipeline, we read packets, uh, we read a burst of packets because for performance reasons everything is working in terms of bursts. So we run with bursts all the time. So we read the burst of packets uh, and then we look up all those packets from that burst. Uh, it's very important to know that it's actually better to work with the burst because now if you have a burst of packet here and if your lookup op operation is based on a burst rather than a single packet, you can interlace those packets, you can hide latency between those packets, you ca can create a very optimized implementation that would actually give you great performance for the whole burst rather than if you just do performance per packet or cycles per packet is much uh, smaller, performance is greater. So we do the lookup at, at this table. What we get is basically we associate with each packet, we get an entry in the table on lookup hit. On lookup miss, what happens is that uh, there is, according to open flow terminology, uh, we have a default entry that is defined. So that default entry is assigned to all the packets that will have lookup miss. So one way or the other, hit or miss, you end up with a, an entry in the table for your packet. So what does that entry contain? It, contain? it it contains some reserved information for us to run with that packet, like for example, know what to do next with it, send it to an output port or drop the packet, all the packets that hit that entry, or um, send the packet to, uh, to the next table. Obviously, different packets from the same burst will go to different entries. Uh, so it's important to know that potentially you can have this burst splitting into multiple bursts, but we still want to to work with bursts rather than a single packet. We, we do our best to do that. So at this point, we actually do the core of the work, which is uh, why did we do this lookup? To do some work on the packet, right? So we need to do some actions on the packet. How do we do that? By running an action handler. So the API allows you to define an action handler for, uh, for each, each of the tables for lookup, meet, miss, and lookup key. So we, we do those actions which are implemented by the user or uh, let's say if you have some example pipelines already developed, you have a set of available actions that you could enable for this. Uh, of course, you can, can run, uh, write your own tables, your own action handlers. So then you go to the next, the next, uh, next element in the pipeline um, until you actually drop all the packets from the input burst or all the packets get to uh, get outside, are sent to one of the output ports. So that's, that's what it is at, at a single core level. Uh, some people say, well, if you are writing, you are forcing us to, to use a framework, to write the code in, 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 in a certain way. Uh, why uh, why would, would I do that? Why would I not simply freestyle code my application? And I can do whatever I want, very, I, it's, it's the, uh, um, the best flexibility that you can get. Well, the answer is that there is, how, how would you actually do it? Because at the end of the day, what packet uh, processing is, in my opinion, and according to OpenFlow, is not my idea. Uh, it's simply, we all day, uh, day in, day out, we simply take packets and we do lookup into tables. It's all about memory lookups. We found out, find out what to do with the, uh, those packets, which is really not much. We just change a few fields in the packet. Forget about encryption, okay? Uh, or compression. Uh, but for header processing, this is what we do, right? We simply uh, uh, read a few fields to take a decision. We change a few fields, we push a header, we change a header. Uh, and then you go to the next table and you do more lookups, maybe using a different key from the packet. So at the end of the day, you cannot escape this circle. You, you, you still, your application will be, unless it's like a, a hello world application. If your application is real, it will actually be a chain of tables or a tree of tables. You will go from one table to the next table. So this is what you get. You get for free all these, uh, using this API, you get for free your skeleton of tables and ports connected together. 
and your ports, you can define the type of your port, whether it's a hardware queue or a software queue or whatever else is there. Right? And then the only thing you need to do is just fill in your, the gaps that are related to your application, like what is specific to your application. And these are the action handlers. So we give you, like a code wizard, we give you, we point you to this function and say, hey, write your code here. Sometimes we write it for you, for some, let's say, example uh, pipelines, example actions, but obviously you can, uh, in, in, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if our examples are not complete for you, you can simply start writing at that point. So that, that will simplify the effort that you, the work. You, you will do less work and it will be less error prone. You don't have to code every time, move packets <coughs> from A to B. We'll move the packets for you. You just need to tell us, okay, now that you got the packet, what do we want to do the packet? Write your code here. So that's what it is at a, a single core level. At a multi-core level, uh, this is what, what it really is. We, we, cre we instantiate, we have these, let's say, pipeline types, like from object-oriented programming. You have classes of functional blocks, right? And um, you instantiate them. You instantiate for a flow classification or a routing pipeline a number of times. You map these instances to CPU cores. At the end of the day, what is, what is an instance? Well, uh, of a pipeline, you have maybe two, two things for a pipeline, or maybe that's on the next slide, but I'll say it anyway. You have a configuration site for the pipeline where you want to update the configuration at runtime. For example, you have a routing pipeline. You want to add routes, delete routes, uh, so on and so forth. Add ARP entries, delete them, list the entries in the table using whatever queries, like give me all the, the routes that... Um, have this length and send packets to that output port. Um, what you also have is your back-end side. So I, I call the <coughs> configuration, I call it the front-end. This is what the user sees. Uh, and user maybe doesn't even have to think that, okay, uh, this is how this actually happens. Well, it's a collection, it's a, it's a, a number of tables connected together that process packets. That is the back-end. So the back-end is really the open flow type of, of pipeline that crunches packets. So at the end of the day, we see, uh, we look at this, each of these pipeline instances, like having <coughs> some packet queues, input queues where we read packets from and output packet queues where we write the, the output packet. So this is the main work, the main purpose in life of this pipeline to process packets. And then we have the message queues where we interact with other master pipelines, control plane, management plane, whatever, name you want to give, you get requests, message, input messages, input message queues where you read requests from, you execute those requests and you send back a response. Okay, please add this route to, to, to your routing table. Okay, both was successful or not. That's the, the response. So that goes through message queues. So that's what we try to, I mean, we have this API, we have these libraries, now we try to use them. We try to eat our own dog food and create something meaningful and, and uh, be proud about it. So that's what uh, IP pipeline is. It's an application, but it's more than that. It's an application that has a few things that could be used to generate applications. So, sorry, going back. Uh, what it has first, it has a configuration file. And I'll, I'll show you an example on the next slide. So what we want here is basically uh, define the structure that you see here. How do we do that? So basically you have to specify, okay, please create this uh, instance, uh, this pipeline, which is an instance of this uh, pipeline type, it's a flow classification or whatever. Assign it to a CPU core. These are the input packet queues. These are the output packet queues. Um, uh, if you want additional message queues, you can do that. There are some default message queues implicitly, implicitly defined. Add any other configuration that is specific to that pipeline type. So for routing, you might define number of routes for full classification, number of flows, and whatever, uh, whatever other parameters. So that's what we want. How do we put this, uh, this uh, which is a nice diagram, uh, how do you put it into, into a text file so that we can process it and create the code for it? So that, that's like the main um, thing that IP pipeline does. So, you have a configuration file. You can instantiate these pipelines. You glue them together. How do you do that? By uh, defining queues, the, the packet queues, and one packet queues 
that is an output from this pipeline is an input to the next pipeline. So how this how we this is how you chain them together. Um, you create all the configure uh, the resources of the application. So it's actually the syntax is quite simple. You you should probably take a look if you didn't see that already. Um, it's it's a, it's a something like defined by reference. So um, when we mention software Q0, we just mention software Q0, and then that's defined from that moment on. Later on, we can ha have a section on a software Q0 that details what uh, those, which, what parameters are used there. If there is no section on software Q0, then there is a software Q0 Q defined with the default parameters. So you can actually use the defaults. De declare it when you declare it is defined with the defaults. You can refine the defaults through a section dedicated to that resource. It could be um, a buffer, a message pool, right? It can be uh, a software queue like an RT ring. It can be a hardware queue. Um, it can be any device that we accept here. It's working. Everything is working this way. You have a command line interface as well. Uh, because as I was mentioning, we look at each pipeline like a whole uh, uh, made up of a front end and the back end. And what we found out is that we spent a lot of time not writing the back end, the pipeline itself, it's easy, but we do spend a lot of time on writing the configuration code, the management code, which is like what happens. That's where the complexity is. And uh, we uh, end up writing a lot of command line interface uh, code. And this is where I, uh, this is the part of the work that I really hate. It's a lot of code to write there is not that, uh, that uh, ergonomic to use that API of the command line interface uh, that we have right now in DPDK. So we end up with a massive amount of code that is not that easy to maintain. But basically, we, we, uh, when we define a pipeline module in this application, we uh, keep together the, the configuration, the command line interface with the backend creation, which is the real pipeline that uh, uh, crunches packets. Uh, so we have commands that we register every time we register a pipeline type. We say, like, add flow classification. Here is flow classification type class for you. Okay. Uh, then we um, say, okay, do you have any command line interface commands that you want to register, Mr. Flow Classification? And you have an array of commands. You simply add those to the CLI of the application. So now you can keep uh, all these things in sync with each other. And last but not least, by any, any means, is this library of reusable pipeline types which are provided as examples. Like you have a pass-through pipeline which is simply a cable, it's converting between hardware queues and software queues, or simply connecting input ports to output ports of whatever type they are. So if you want to convert between uh, a hardware queue and a software queue, or the other way around, or between a software queue and something, uh, another software queue, you can use this cable which is the pass-through pipeline. Uh, we have some interesting things that you can do along the way. It's not just, okay, you, you, uh, the packet is traveling through the cable, but you can also have some action handlers there <coughs> that cable. So you can do some transformation on the packet as well. You have a flow classification pipeline. You have a firewall pipeline, which is basically ACL. Uh, you have um, a routing pipeline that can have R enabled or uh, disabled. Now we actually pushed some patches uh, to allow to do uh, other packet encapsulations, not just Ethernet. We can do MPLS as well, a number of MPLS labels, up to four labels, variable number. We can do uh, uh, queue in queue, so VLAN labels. And we'll probably add, add more uh, as, we, as we start looking into, let's say, use cases, and we see that we need one packet encapsulation or the other, we add it. Uh, we, we do have a framework and uh, for this pipeline, for the routing pipeline, on how to do encapsulation, packet encapsulation. Um, so that's, that's what it is. Um, so maybe look at a, an example. Uh, this is an example of a configuration file. This is, let's say, the pipeline that we want to create for uh, NIC ports, each one using a single queue. So look at these arrows as having a queue on them. Um, all these queues are input ports for this pass-through pipeline. Uh, which is really just cables here. Uh, but this is uh, simply uh, the, uh, the, the reason for this here is to actually serve flow classification. So flow classification is the next pipeline here. Both of these pipelines are put on the same CPU core. That's one configuration. And then uh, they, they send packets to another routing pipeline that sends packets to, to hardware queues straight away. 
So, so that's how we do it. Um, pipeline zero is the master pipeline that runs the command line interface. It's not shown here. It's uh, simply communicating with these other pipelines through messages. Um, pipeline one is the pass-through pipeline. So the type is uh, pass-through here, flow classification here, routing here. Uh, the core is basically uh, CPU core where to map that pipeline. Uh, and then you have the packet queues in and out defined for each of these pipelines. So here you have RSQ 0.0, .0 that's a hardware queue for this new port. Uh, the, the, the hardware queue 0 of port 0, this is the hardware queue 0 of port 1, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, software queue 0 is an output queue from, uh, from this pipeline, but it's an input queue into the next pipeline. So this is how we connect things together. And basically this is configuration part. So these things are common for all the pipelines. Then you have some other options here that are specific to each pipeline type. So you can uh, define them and enable some of these actions, or you can simply keep them out and the, the actions associated actions are disabled. So for example, in here, what we have is a kind of simple DMA mechanism that also masks some bytes in the packet. So in this case, let's say flow classification would need the two VLAN labels as the flow identifier, the, the flow lookup key, the customer ID, SVLAN and CVLAN, right? But we want to get uh, to, to, to zero out some bits, the, the QoS bits from the label and uh, whatever other bits are there, um, and the ether types. We might want to do that. So then we have this mask over here, which is basically uh, masking uh, the, this 8-byte key, 8-byte long key. So it's simply saying, keep just the VLAN IDs out of this label, but you end up with eight bytes as your lookup key. So, so then that feeds into the next table. You save it in some other place in the packet. We call it metadata. The buffer basically can store uh, the packet bytes, and everything else could be used as metadata. You can even get metadata into the packet. For example, your, uh, let's say, um, you remove the input Ethernet header, right? So that's like 14 bytes. You can use temporarily that space to store something else if you want. It's a cache line, you might have it in the cache. Sometimes it might work to, to write to the same cache line that you already have. Some other times might actually be a liability, so you don't want to do that. So everything is metadata, packet data, and packet metadata kind of is the same thing. Uh, the, only, the, the real difference comes at transmission because metadata is not sent out. So real data is sent out, metadata is not sent out. Um, you can see all these parameters here that you can define, like for flow classification. We, we are testing with 60 million flows, or we can actually have uh, 64K flows. Uh, the, the key size is 8 bytes. Uh, we read it from this, uh, this place in the buffer. These are offsets in the packet buffer. Uh, routing pipeline, the same number of routes. Uh, we enable MPLS encapsulation. Uh, we might we decide to color uh, to put to add the color of uh, uh, the packet into the MPLS experimental bits uh, and some offsets in the packets. That basically each of these pipelines is an in independent block. But since you have to glue them together, some of these fields are redundant with fields from from the other pipelines. And it's it's kind of. Maybe uh, some people will not like it. It's some kind of wires sticking out of this and you, that you have to connect. But that's actually how you would build something out of a Lego. It might not look perfect, not that shiny, but it actually works. And you can do spaceships out of Lego blocks. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll do something uh, close to that. I have a question. Um, I'm not understanding it. So you were talking about OpenFlow. And in this in this slide, you have several pipelines. You said, yes. But are there really pipelines, pipelines, or, or tables? Because generally, in OpenFlow, you have a single pipeline with multiple tables. Yes. So it's a little bit confusing. This. Yeah. So at the, where, uh, the place where we actually borrowed OpenFlow concepts is to build a single pipeline out of tables, ports, and actions. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, how do you map to to multi-core? So then the answer is, OK, you create all these pipelines that are kind of single core. You can put multiple of them on the same core. But then uh, you connect pipelines. You, you create multiple pipelines. It's a kind of uh, bending a bit the terminology. Okay. So in our, in our design here, a pipeline is a block. 
and the application is the super pipeline if you want. So you you re, you do the and we kind of use this uh, interchangeably. It's like the application is the pipeline or the super pipeline made out of core level pipelines. If you want. Okay, so within one of sure. So within one of these uh, loop uh, boxes, there are multiple tables, or there is a single table. So it depends on the on the on the functional block in question. For example, for routing. Uh, one of the parameters here which has the default value of no is R, whether you want to enable an R table. Definitely you need to have an LPM table here for routing. You can also have an R table, so this will be two tables. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right here in this case, since, uh, since R is uh, not set to yes, then R is disabled, so you have a single table. But the answer is, you see, uh, when you create a functional block, um, which is just a block, you don't end up with so many tables. If you want to complicate things, you might add another table here, routing for tunneling. Okay, but two, three tables is probably the most that you can run on a single core, if you want. Uh, on, on, let's say on a single functional block that goes to a core. Uh, if you want more than that, I mean, the question is, you have to have a trade-off. How many things you put in, a same, in the same block without getting the overhead? Because you instantiate that and you connect it with other blocks in a way that you don't know. So you have to stop at some point. You don't want to have 10 tables here. You can, if you want, but you don't want to stash too many 10 tables because you, you could not reuse that later on. If you have 10 tables, it's very difficult to, 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 to take them out later let's say, to reuse them for other applications. But you can do any number of tables you want does here. It, does it not become a trade-off It's a great question. So uh, I think it's on the next slide. This, so this, this is like the... Uh, the set of possibilities which is kind of infinite here. So this is exactly what you kind of say. So um, you could have, for example, this, this configuration over here, where you actually throw each of these uh, instances, pipeline instances, to different CPU cores. So this, like, this is a pipeline, this is a CPU core, right? But uh, just with a simple change in the configuration file by uh, going back and setting a different, basically here, core and core are set to the same value. You can do this here as well, and you can put all these things on the same CPU core. So instantly, if you want, I'm sure that some people won't agree with me, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Instance, instantly, you are transforming a pipeline <coughs> configuration into a run-to-completion configuration, because you put everything on the same core. You, maybe you do it in a special way, so you, you, uh, what happens in here is like you definitely do run to completion, the packet uh, is not exiting the core until it's done, uh, but there, are, there is not just one packet in flight, there are a lot of packets that are interlaced. So this is, this is run to completion, and it's functionally still a pipeline within, obviously it's a functional by pipeline, you need to do flow classification on a packet before you do metering. So, at the functional level, it's a functional pipeline. But at the core level, this is run to completion because it's a single core here. And at the core level, this is a pipeline because there are several cores chained together and the only some things get done on a, any specific CPU core. So, that's the possibility thinking here, how many things you can do. And obviously, configuration uh, performance will be totally different but you can quickly test and enable this configuration just from the config file, straight away. So, so like we were joking uh, yesterday that uh, the bottleneck becomes your keyboard. You might have not the right keyboard, you might be using an American keyboard, and now you get an English keyboard and you cannot get that, that key. So very easy, very easy to do. Um, so, Sorry, I have one, one more question about yeah. that. So when I see multiple reboots uh, ports and ports, uh, one of these questions were about this Sometimes it's really risky uh, to reverse the order of packets if you have a pi pipeline with multiple parallel uh, uh, flows in the pipeline, you know, or and especially if you do bulk transmit from single queue and then bulk transmit from another queue, 
So the way you pull on the queue, input queues and you will you transmit on the output queues may may matter for some applications. So have you considered that, uh, or maybe that's in the future? That's absolutely because packet ordering is is something. It's it's a, it's a requirement that we cannot uh, negotiate. So uh, uh, the answer to your question is. We, we do round robin uh, between the input ports. We don't have weights. Um, obviously, maybe this port only contains jumbo frames and this port only contains small packets, so then it will take more to process the burst from this port. We don't do that. We don't look into that. What we have is a very simple configuration, a round robin of these ports. But once we read a burst of packets from this port, we run with that burst of packets until we, we, we exhaust, exhaust it. So then, a package from belonging to the same flow will only be read from the same input port. So then the order is preserved. We never uh, reorder packets within the burst. So then, once we get done with that burst, we go and read another burst. So this is how we preserve packet order. <coughs> Make sense? That doesn't work if you make it one, you ship them off, they come back because quick assist gets it out of order, you put them out, you've got to preserve that flow order. So quick assist will not put them out of order? Um, it may, you can send them to different engines, there's different ways of getting packets out of order pretty quickly. Yeah, but you need to know what you're doing, so in that case you need to preserve the packet ordering yourself, so you, you, you don't send the flow packets from uh, uh, the same flow to different, different ports. That's, if you, that's if the you preserve, that's that guy's yeah. okay. nice point. Another question is that if you have yes, uh, so the same challenge is when you have multiple input queues and some RSS scheme, right? So you need to make sure that the single flow goes to a single input queue. Yes. Otherwise, it, it, it may be messy, right? So so this is the responsibility of the implementer right now. So right? So, so that's right. I mean, the answer, my answer is we do the best that we can do to preserve the packet ordering. But uh, you also have to do your part in this job. So if you screw back, if you want to screw back a ordering, you can do it. Um, all this is currently implemented is totally pole. All this is currently implemented is totally pole mode, which is great for doing benchmarks and performance, but totally impractical in real world systems. Um, we just introduced uh, interrupt based nappy-ish receive side, but none of this works in that environment yet? Is there plans to get there? Um, I didn't think about this. I think it should be hidden under the pull mode driver, right? So I'm asking for packets. Well, it's not hidden. You have to basically fall back to every pipeline stage has to fall back to an ePoll on all its input sources, and all the input sources need to generate ePoll events. Um, so that every part of the pipeline basically is idle at zero CPU usage, uh, especially if you're a guest in an environment or you're, um, you know, some of us don't have 64 core CPUs kicking around um, to go do this. Yeah. So you, you basically want to uh, say, hey, I'm not going to run this pipeline unless I have a packet. Waiting. Unless I have something on any of my input sources. Yes. Yeah. Something to think about. We don't have this right now. Okay. How are you handling the NUMA issue uh, in your configurations? So how it could be handled? Uh, NUMA issue. There is no NUMA issue. Just put whatever CPU code you want. Yeah. You, you solved it. Another question? Basically. Just a second. So, so, so Mirek. You just set a different core here. Uh, th there is a scheme actually to name this core. This is not the core from uh, ProxyPU info. It's not that ID. It's actually an abbreviation. What, uh, what you can do is you put, uh, it's like uh, uh, S0C5H. What that means is socket zero core five hyper thread. So th this is kind of an, another example what you can put here. So you can actually Pick whatever core you want on whatever CPU socket you want and put it here. These queues are actually in memory. So, uh, so they will work. 
what I'll show you is actually one feature is that we just sent a patch for. We can move these pipelines. Let's say I start with this pipeline instance on this core, and later on during my testing or whatever my, my uh, application, I, I can actually move it to a different core. Because what the pipeline is is basically a bunch of data structures, and it's just a pointer to them. And you pass the pointer to this core or you get the pointer to the other core. It, does this answer your number question? Before, before there was another question. Hi, Hanoch from Cisco. Uh, have you considered using the ClickOS uh, idea? It's very similar. ClickOS build the same Lego stuff. Uh, I didn't look much into that, but obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to reuse ideas. I mean, nothing from here was kind of invented by us. I mean, it's open flow concepts. Yeah. So, so there's actually a board of DVD game to click as well. I think it is open source. Um, you can go try to, there's a bunch of examples that did that quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, also, regarding... Uh, yeah. So, so this is all static shape in the water, so how do you guarantee utilization of all the CPUs? What if you change some code or, or one of the blue blocks and you know, the next? Do you have to statically work? The application, if I want to run on two CPUs or ten CPUs, will it naturally scale? Or is this a mad product like, you know, with this? You mean the application? You can't. This time Yeah, so the idea is that you might want to start with all these things thrown on, on different CPU cores, and then you realize, like, hey, if I actually put these things together, these two on the same CPU core, I get the same performance. So then I, I, I'm, you, you will start consolidating and looking for the best core configuration. Obviously, there is a cost to send packets from one CPU core to another. Right, well, I'm an administrator, I'm running an orchestrator. So you're saying that for, for, for platform A, B, and C, I have to use a different mapping because maybe they have different IPC, different frequency, different memory. So, so what you can do is you can, uh, like, uh, you, let's say you created this application and you, have, uh, you may have different profiles. So let's say you have a configuration file for uh, Xeon and another configuration file for Rangely and another for RAM, right? If you look in OpenStack, how OpenStack does things, you have profiles. You have a tiny profile and a large profile and whatever profile for your application. So you can actually define several profiles. And you can pick the one, uh, which one you want to, decide which one you want to pick at runtime based on what you find there. Would this make sense? Would this make sense? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> so, and in order to, to analyze the different profiles, what, what kind of um, performance analysis tool can, can, we, can we get or can we bind with it to, to analyze the, the CPU usage of each, each pipeline, the memory boundaries, uh, the things which are internal to the, to the CPUs, just to be sure that we did the right settings and that we, are, that we are on the right profile for the right settings? So I think you, there are tools from Intel where, to measure memory bandwidth and all that stuff, right? Uh, that, that does not depend on here. On CPU core utilization, we are actually working on a patch. There, is, there are some ABI changes that we need to work through. Uh, for example, on this pipeline, uh, pipeline run, okay, we have this function. And it, it, uh, the return value is error or success. We want to change that to actually give us the number of packets that were read from a port and actually simplify it a bit so on every iteration just read a port, a single port rather than all the ports. So then you could track, okay, did you actually read any packet and how many cycles you spend without doing any useful work? Just calling. And then we'll create these statistics uh, for CPU utilization that will keep per thread. And then you can actually ask for them like uh, through the CLI, give us the CPU utilization for this, this core and the other core. But, but I think that CPU utilization or the question that was raised there and the dynamic <coughs> in this pipeline, it just varies for every flow. For some flows where we go through pipeline one, two, and three, 
having all the same core is great. But for other groups, which goes in one, two, or five, um, you will effectively either put everything on the same core or or you're trying to optimize for a single flow. And it may not yes. work for another one. Yeah, but you, you can. You can do that in advance. I mean, you 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 you, you know in advance yeah, I, your traffic I mean, that's profile. Where I'm saying, yes. So static mapping is, is probably uh, good to start with. Trying to do it dynamically is, is going to just change. You you start with with the, with the mapping, and you can have several profiles, and it's like the same. What this helps you is tune your application. You tune your application, uh, and you can create several profiles for your application, and it's like uh, any for any VNF any virtual network function application. You can tear it down, you can restart it, you can restart it on a different core. Now maybe your question was whether I can actually do this through an orchestrator at the core level or can I, or shall I do it just at the application level? So that's an open question. My vote right now would be you, you keep this tool which is similar to an orchestrator. Right? This is exactly what it is. I would keep it, I would split it into, I would decouple, I would just find my best configuration file for, let's say, my particular platform and, and, and profile, and then just create a binary out of that, and then just let, let OpenStack to manage that binary, rather than let OpenStack to manage my internal course within the application. That would probably be too complex. Yeah, I think, I think where um, an external entity might be useful is if one of your pipeline is in load actions, you might want to then pin that down to so we leave this, this uh, we allow people to do that but I didn't try it myself so my, my priority now is like in the command line interface be able to, to, to move a pipeline instance from here to here obviously you could put that you could, you could plug that into an orchestrator but maybe it would be too complex I mean that orchestrator would have to know a lot of things and decide a lot of low level things so it sounds level. like there's a lot of questions about this particular topic. Maybe we can continue the discussion with those interested with Christian after the talk. I have one more question here on a different topic, and then I think it's almost time for the coffee break. Yeah, I do have so, uh, two, two more slides. Okay, then I'll let you continue. Sorry, just one last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you 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 touched on a very sensitive point. I mean, um, we actually have a session later on. Uh, uh, is it tomorrow with Venki uh, on uh, some 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 drawbacks of packet processing? Uh, there is definitely a cost. If you look into the Intel optimization manual, you will see that there is a cost when. Uh, I mean, what a queue is is basically shared memory between two CPU cores, right? So uh, it's all about cache lines and how they ping pong between those cores. Right, so uh, if you if if uh, if you have to bring that data into your CPU core cache, uh, and that data is actually in the, the L1 or L2 cache of different core, it actually takes more cycles. You pay a penalty versus if you read it from L3 cache. But there are a number of tricks that we can play here. So we can do prefetching. We can do uh, a smart way of writing interlacing packets so that we hide the, the, the latency of these prefetches. You can look into the packet framework libraries. There are a ton of examples. Everything is written this way. Every action handler is a strange way, a really strange way to write a for loop, yeah. right? So, so I think you would talk about a bit of that model, but there is one best kept secret inside the EDK called test. Yeah. Um, so just go, go look at that one, and you, there's a ring of author test. And you give it a core mask, and we'll do single core, single core type of thread, and two different cores. And we'll give you numbers for pushing one, pulling one, pushing two, pulling two. We wrote that entire thing. And the difference you'll see is this. It's exactly what he pointed out. When you go to LLC and back, there's a penalty. If you're going within the same core, you're going with the L1 and back. OK. Easy enough. Cache point L1 and back is four cycles. Hit on LLC is 40 cycles. So how do you get across 40 cycles? Well, you amortize it across eight factors. At that point, it, the cost becomes almost the same. 
the only, the only caveat to that though is that that's only talking, that's only measuring the pointer transfer, not the packet data. Yes. Which the so, and there's point. another interesting thing with the packet data transfer. So, yeah, so you have to pay that cost, but the, the thing that you can do, you can hide the cost. You can, we, you, because there are other inefficiencies in any, any processing. You have other packets. You can do something else on other packets in the same verse. So, so that's what keeps us awake at night. We think about these problems and how we can actually write that piece of code to do encapsulation of, uh, let's say, MPLS labels or whatever in a way that we can hide those, those costs. So I have a, a small question here, <laughs> <laughs> completely unrelated <laughs> or sort of unrelated. Um, you were saying that you had a pipeline which was doing classification, uh, but it might be that there are other pipelines, other blue boxes over here um, that may require some sort of packet parsing, so packet classification, at least I call it packet classification, um, I, my question is, <clears throat> yeah. So, for instance, just finding out where uh, TCP header is uh, to read the values and stuff like that, in order to do some sort of matching on this. Um, my question is, is there a way to somehow share this state if you have already parsed? Because simple packets, Ethernet, IP, it's pretty simple, yeah. and you can get information from the NIC out of this. But more complicated packets, which have encapsulations which you have to actually do a parsing to know exactly where the header is. Um, with this packet classification module that you were talking about, do you share this state along the pipelines? So passing it or you said about the metadata, but yeah. I don't know if it's enough with this. Uh, so in for example to... in here, um, uh, we read this lookup key and we put it um, we, we transform it through a mask, we read it from this offset in the buffer because you know here is where our uh, uh, IT header will be uh, located for this queue. Okay, so it's at the application level we know this where, where things are in the buffer. And we read those bytes uh, into this destination at offset zero in like in the headroom of the packet. And then we, uh, the, the um, The key offset is the same. You see the comment in here, you, you basically say, okay, I place some metadata for you at offset zero, I place eight bytes, this have to be your lookup, read, read it from offset zero. Yeah, but this is for fixed packets. What if you're getting packets that have different offsets because they are different packets? That's, well, that was more or less the question, because you need to dynamically yeah. parse and dynamically store this information. Yeah, the, the design, uh, um, design, let's say, uh, paradigm here is that you would actually do uh, packet filtering on the NIC side, or you would actually do use some cores to do that for you. For example, let's say MPLS, you have a variable number of labels. You look there in the packet on the NIC or, or in software, and you store that, uh, that uh, result as metadata and is used by, by, by other pipelines. But the design is for most of the cases which are simple cases, you don't have this complicated MPLS uh, optional header thing. So what you do is you will bifurcate traffic and put different packet types to different queues. So then within the same, within a specific queue, all the packets will actually have the same buffer format. So then you can apply this thing per port. And then for another port of the same pipeline, you can have another, some other set of offsets, offsets right? So this is how we, we look at these things, because uh, at the end of the day, our priority is to get the most frequent cases, the critical cases yeah, with for, high performance. For homogeneous, for homogeneous, let's say, traffic, that's, that would work, but if you start that for, for networks where there is some sort of homogeneous traffic, that would work, but if you are you know, in certain places where they have different traffic patterns, the number of queues can increase to a number where you cannot really handle it this way. Find me those cases. If they are okay. important, we'll change this. This is work in progress. This is not done. I'm not planning to retire any time. <laughs> <laughs> and can, on that topic, can I suggest we continue this over a coffee? Yes. And uh, please thank our speaker, Christian. No. Thank you uh, very let, much. Let me finish this. Two, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is important. Uh, so so the, the, what I want to say here in terms of um, how you develop this. So let's say you, you, you created your, let's say, simple chain or simple capsule of blocks, right? And you, you end up with this conclusion that it's better to put uh, these three blocks on this configuration. So the next step is now what? How do I scale? 
How do I multiply this performance? Maybe I only get 5 million packets here. How do I get to 20? I still have a lot of CPU cores left out. So you simply do this kind of, thing, of things. You clone basically this setup. You can consolidate some of these functions. So for example, you can have this setup. Here, the bottleneck probably is flow classification, because that's your input uh, block might be a load balancer or flow classification. And whatever you can do with one core, then that, that's your, like your, uh, your upper limit of performance. Here, you kind of uh, get to a, a, an RX-oriented pipeline you can, where you have some ports handled completely by some cores. But then you definitely need to do routing. So they will converge into a routing box. And then routing will be your bottleneck. And here is another thing that you can also do. You can also clone this routing block, and then you can route to different hardware queues. So you can basically pass this switching problem to the hardware, if you can. So this is how, like, a few simple examples of what could be done to actually, once you have a setup, uh, you have, like, a set of course, a minimal set of course to do your functionality with this performance, how you can clone it, provided that you still have CPU cores, until you hit whatever other bottleneck. Maybe it might be memory bandwidth, or maybe you are running out of CPU cores. And this is how you can scale up performance. And you can easily do that, you'll probably agree with me, from a configuration file. It will take five minutes to, to copy-paste lines in there. So uh, please thank our speaker on that note. Christian, we really have to cut you off there at this point, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I invite everyone to continue the discussion with you at a later point. There's time over coffee. There'll be time for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Christian. I was done anyway. Thank you.